<clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, as Mike said, um, I tell you what you already know. And I'm in a good position because I'm going to tell you what you already know because you already heard it. I'm going to repeat what Anthony Esselin said, but from a different perspective, because he is talking about the imagination and I have none. I've never had an original idea in my life. <laughs> I'm proud of this. If you notice that people with original ideas are selling pamphlets in Times Square. Um, I'm going to um, really tell you the same story and I'm also going to base it unoriginally on a couple of quotations from memor memorable talks, talks that have stayed with me for a long time. And I'm going to begin, you were speaking about 34 years, I, I see your 34 years and I raise you. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm so delighted, by the way, to talk about something that many of you will have remembered a time back in the very early days of the Reagan administration. And I've been teaching a course this semester, a tutorial, and I have to keep reminding myself that these students don't remember the things that I remember. But I think most of you in this audience remember the early days of the Heritage Found I'm sorry, of the Reagan Foundation, when I was working at the Heritage Foundation. And these were heady days for those of us who were at Heritage, um, because we had been on the outs during the Carter administration. We were doing our research and nobody was listening. And now suddenly Reagan was coming into office and people were listening, people were paying attention to us. And if you remember back to those days, you remember that we were trying to sort it out what it meant to be a conservative. And there were different movements, the libertarians and the economic conservatives, the paleoconservatives and the neoconservatives. And I was in charge at the time of bringing speakers, guest speakers into the Heritage Foundation. And one of the speakers that I brought in was Midge Decker, wonderful woman who uh, was sort of the first lady of the neoconservative movement. Now, the neoconservatives were not quite trusted by the paleoconservatives, like myself. Uh, and so when we brought her to speak at the Heritage Foundation, there was a little ripple of uneasiness. Between the time when I invited her to speak and the time when she showed up to speak, unbeknownst to me, she had been invited to be on the board of the Heritage Foundation and accepted, which was a coup for Heritage to think that this leading lady of the neoconservative movement would now throw in her lot with them. It was a very good choice because Midge De was most of the neoconservatives preferred to focus on foreign policy or maybe economic affairs. Midge focused on family. She was an anti-feminist, which of course is touching the third rail. And she came to speak on feminism at the Heritage Foundation. One quote that I have to give you, it's not the quote that I'm basing this talk on, but she said how in the course of this talk that she gave that evening, she recalled how Gloria Steinem had expressed her pity for housewives who have no more intellectual stimulation than can be provided by a three-year-old. And Midge Decker, a wonderfully expressive woman with big features and big everything about her, opened her big eyes behind her big glasses and with exquisite timing, she said, I would so much rather spend a month with a three-year-old than one hour with Midge Decker. I'm sorry, with Gloria Steinem. <laughs> Stepped on that one, sorry. But in the course of introducing herself to this event and fully cognizant of the fact that there were these tensions and these suspicions about the neoconservatives, 
Midge Dechter said that she was very glad that she had been invited to be on the Board of Heritage and she was glad to accept because, as she put it, you have to join the team you're on. You have to join the team you're on. It's the first quotation I want to give you. The second, much more recent vintage, is from someone many of you know. I think, Amy, you might know William Fahey. <laughs> uh, at an event not too much unlike this several years ago, I couldn't tell you exactly how many, I was vaguely interested in Thomas More College at this point, and I was invited to a dinner, and I heard William Fahey say something about how he took the mission of Thomas More College as the re-evangelization of New England, and that stuck with me. It stuck with me to this day. Again, I invite you to go back to those days. It was in the days of Pope Benedict XVI. Uh, it was a day when we spoke a lot about the new evangelization. And we were all very enthusiastic about the new evangelization. It was a wonderful idea. And of course, you know what it means to re-evangelize, to bring the message of the gospel back to the places where it was once dominant where it was once the defining culture, to bring it back to that. <clears throat> We're all for the new evangelization, but what is it that you do to adv advance the new evangelization? It's not easy to figure out on a daily basis. You wake up, you brush your teeth, and now the new evangelization. <laughs> but when you say to re-evangelize re New England, I felt okay, I can begin to sort out a program of how we would start to go about that. Indeed, I did begin, and I fleshed it out, and I sent a memo to William Fahey, and a few years later, the Center for the Restoration of Christian Culture was born out of a vision that we all share in common, that New England can be re-evangelized. And in fact, I argue tonight, as I argue frequently, that the re-evangelization of Western civilization should begin in New England. I think we are in the very best place for this effort. Now, you might say, what are you talking about? We're in the very worst place, to which I say, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there's nowhere better because there's nowhere worse. Uh, there probably are places worse. Actually, I think the German-speaking world, but that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> uh, in the United States, this is the worst place to begin, and that's why it's the best place to begin. Why? Because this pendulum swings only so far. It's got to come back. Because the denial of human nature ultimately will not stand. Because you cannot continue to feed people something that is not sustaining them. Eventually, the pendulum switches back. Nature abhors a vacuum, and there is a vacuum here. There's a vacuum on New England, and it's a vacuum of reality. So if we inject a little reality, it will attract people. And by the way, look at the history of New England. This is where the American Revolution began. This is where the abolition movement began, the abolition of slavery. It's where a lot of other things began that I wish hadn't begun. But things begin in New England. It is a place of intellectual ferment. It always has been. And you know, as Midge Dechter could not tolerate the intellectual ferment of Gloria Steinem, there's a limited number of years that the people of New England can live on the intellectual sustenance of the Boston Globe editorial page. <laughs> it won't stand. We are dealing now with the consequences of a long period of decline in the culture of New England and the world, I don't know the Western world, I don't have to tell you that. Ideas have consequences. We are seeing the great-grandchildren of the ideas that went wrong a couple of generations ago. We're seeing, as Anthony Esselin has said,
the imagination dumbed down. I just, this morning, came across a line in your book, Nostalgia, about we are dealing today with shakerism without the woodworking skills. <laughs> His lie. It is sterile. It is ultimately unsatisfactory. It will not stand. People want more. Everybody wants more. And what people want is something we have. We have it here. We've seen it tonight in our fellowship over dinner, in the dinner, uh, in the beautiful music. We've seen it. We want the truth. The soul wants the truth more and more. We're seeing a crisis of our civilization. Pope Benedict XVI, in his great speech at Regensburg, talked about a crisis of reason. It's a crisis in two directions, as he pointed out. It's a crisis of the West, which has lost its ability to see reason in partnership with faith. It's a crisis of the West in conflict with Islam, which has never been very good at seeing reason in conflict with, in conjunction with faith, that both arms have to come together, faith and reason. And the West today is defenseless. It's defenseless against Islam. It's defenseless against every other ideology that comes along. Um, you know, Pope John Paul and Pope Benedict spent a lot of, both spent a lot of time insisting to the leaders of the European Union that you have to recognize the Christian roots of Europe. Because otherwise, what are the roots of Europe? What does have, Europe have in common? What do these nations have in common? other than the Christian culture, nothing. If it's only economic interests, they, ch they change from year to year. If you're not based on anything more profound than that, you're not based on anything uh, of any enduring. And the European Union leaders did not listen to the popes, they never have. And uh, therefore, I believe the European Union is doomed unless it wises up fairly quickly. Um, you look at Europe and I, now I take back what I said earlier about our being in the worst possible. Europe is ahead of us on this slide. And my wife Lila made a point about the Islamic um, immigration and the threat uh, that Islamic immigration poses to Europe. And she's pointed out that in a sense, don't blame the immigrants. Think of yourself, if you're walking through the woods, you're lost in the woods, uh, you come across a cabin, you knock on the door, there's nobody there, you go in. It's comfortable, there's food, there's heat, there's music, you have everything you want, it's there. Wouldn't you move in and take over? And this is what's happening in Europe. There is no defense. It's not, I'm not talking about military defense. I'm talking about cultural defense. You move in with your Islamic culture to a place that has no culture left. You're the only game in town. Why not take over? Well, we're seeing the same sort of thing. It's not Islam here. It's something that in a way is more pernicious because it seems homegrown. It's a sort of neo-paganism. Uh, our society is or very easily could be defenseless, but I argue that it is not defenseless because of institutions such as the one we're talking about tonight, we're representing tonight. At Thomas More College, we're not just studying an abstract truth, although that's very important to understand the theory, to understand the forms and the substances. We're talking about a lived truth. We're not talking about book knowledge. We're talking about knowledge in the soul, in the mind, in the heart. It's unitive. You come to the canvas and you see, uh, well, I'm reminded of what Paul Jackson said earlier, you know, we're not forming students for nothing. We're forming them morally as well as 
intellectually. You come and you see students who are healthy and happy. I say healthy, it's flu season. <laughs> They're usually healthy and more frequently happy. <laughs> um, like the flu, happiness is contagious. You come here and you want some. You want to be part of this. You want to be able to sing like these people. I was ready to take the bass part in the talus. <laughs> you see it, you want to do it. And this is our secret ingredient. You know, I'm, I'm uh, reminded of the line from Mark Twain, who said he had the quiet confidence of a Christian holding <laughs> We have something every We win this hand. If we play this hand, we win this hand. But we have to play the hand. I know because I wanted this. I saw what was happening at Thomas More. I wanted to be a part of it. My daughter Bridget, who just graduated and who you've seen playing the fiddle and singing, she wanted it. We had a great experience. She had a great experience. We were very happy here. By the way, the Lawler family have had seven children and how many? Ten different colleges because they all transfer, I think. Uh, Bridget is the only one who is perfectly happy with the college that she went to. Um, there's some big name colleges on that list. Um, <laughs> Anthony Esselin wanted it. He was driven out of St. Used to be a Catholic college. He found a home here. I found it late in my career. I found a congenial place. I was talking with Luke earlier about how I dropped out of grad school because I felt I was going to be, I thought I'd teach political theory. And that was now, this is, now we're talking 50 years ago almost. And, um, not quite. And uh, <laughs> I thought I would teach political theory, and I realized I don't think I can survive in the academic. Even then, I didn't like the academic world as I saw it, and it hasn't gotten any better since then. And I wanted to teach things like the American founding. Uh, two years ago, I was teaching the American founding here at Thomas More. It's funny how things work out in God's providence. Late in my career, I found this convenial, congenial place. And so I decided that I wanted to give Thomas More College my time, my talent, and now tonight my treasure to help evangelize New England. And I want to encourage you all to do what I have done. Join the team you're on. Thank you.